Well, I hope that you enjoyed listening to that song. It is certainly one of a favourite year in our church, one that we sing quite often. Something that we did earlier this week as we sent out a message to all the young people in our church is that we would like them to take photographs of uh, nature, of, of some of the beauty of creation, uh, or maybe some things of their own creation. And uh, they've been sending in photographs and and what you're going to see, or you might have already seen, is um, at various stages some photographs that have been the backgrounds for some of the titles uh, during the service. So as you see these pictures pop up, these are pictures that have been taken uh, by uh, children in, in our church. And we're going to be using them in the coming weeks uh, just to share uh, the beauty of God's creation to remind us of why we are so thankful. So, so just to let you know about that, um, that our children have been uh, doing some fantastic stuff. Uh, during this time of lockdown and contributing to the life of our church. We're going to turn to our Bibles now. We're going to turn to Matthew chapter 9. It's quite a long passage. Uh, Libby will certainly um, agree with me on that. Uh, Matthew chapter 9, we're going to be reading from verse 35 through to the end of the chapter and then into chapter 10 uh, up to verse 21. And one of our members from Machrafelt, Libby, uh, will be reading for us. So if you open your Bibles now to Matthew chapter 9. The workers are few. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus sends out the workers. Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and illness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal those who are ill. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff. For the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay with their, their, stay with their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that time. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard, for you will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. 
But when they arrest you, do not worry about what you say or how to say it. At that time you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Amen. Thank you, Libby, for reading that passage of Scripture for us. Um, very long passage and a lot in it. Uh, let us pray. A loving God, as we think about these words that Libby has read to us, we thank you, God, that uh, they speak a truth to us that we need to hold fast to. It's an uncomfortable truth, uh, but it comes from your lips. And so, God, we know that we can rely on it. We pray, Lord, as we ponder on these words, that you will just prepare our hearts and our minds to hear what we have to say. And from these words, Lord, we will respond faithfully, particularly to the calling that you have given us to go and make disciples. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So that's a very long passage that we've looked at there today uh, and all that we've read. We haven't looked at it yet. We're about to. You could be sitting worrying that this is going to be a long one. And I'll be honest with you, uh, this is the second time I'm recording the sermon because you know what? It was a long one and I wasn't intending it to be that way. So I'm coming back to this passage again and there's, there's four points that I want to bring out of this passage that I think are really important for us to hear. And I want to be as brief as possible, as concise as possible on them. Because even though this is a long passage to look at, the message in it is quite a clear and concise message. And so I want to try and keep the sermon that way. It's a good follow-on passage from last week's sermon, which was about going and making disciples, because what we see here is, is four things, and these four things that I said I wanted to highlight. The one is, is we see why God wants to be in a relationship with people. We spoke last week that God is a God of relationship. This one tells us why God wants to be in a relationship with people. The second thing is it reminds us that God wants to be in partnership with Him. It talks a little bit about what that partnership looks like. The third thing is, is a reminder that it's not easy to be in partnership with God. When we go and do the work of God, it is hard. And there are consequences that are hard. And the fourth thing that I want to highlight in this passage is how God looks to protect us when we go out and do this work for him. So those are the four things that I want to look at. And as I said, I want to try to be as brief as possible in each of those four points. The first one is this. God goes out or Jesus goes out and does the work of the kingdom we see that in the start it's uh, the opening verses say to us that he goes around into the towns and the villages and the cities and he preaches about the kingdom and he gives gl glimpses of what the kingdom looks like he heals people and casts out demons verse 36 of chapter 9 says this when he saw the crowds he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd the motivation for god wanting to be in a relationship with them is his love for us God loves people. And when he looks and sees how they are lost without him, he is even more desperate to be in a relationship with us. They are like sheep without a shepherd. And so God is desperate to be that good shepherd. Because a good shepherd protects the flock. A good shepherd leads the flock from green pasture to green pasture. In the world we live in, people are trying to find what will feed them for life and how easily those things run out. And they don't nourish us, any, us anymore. But a good shepherd recognizes when the sheep need to be moved for more nourishment. And so God doesn't want us to feel helpless and harassed. He loves us. He wants to be in a relationship with us. And as he looks on humanity and sees how lost we are, he wants to be our good shepherd he wants to be your good shepherd so the first thing we see this is why God wants to be in a relationship with people it is because of his love and compassion 
But then God, as, as Jesus looks upon these people that are lost, he recognizes that the most effective way to bring these people into the kingdom is to be in partnership with us, with his followers. He says to his disciples, oh, let me find it here because I've, I've jumped on. Um, he says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. But he doesn't say, well, it's a lost cause. What he says is, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers uh, into his harvest field. You see, right from the very start of the Bible, when God creates all things and it's good and he creates humanity and it's very good. He puts the man to work in the garden, to work in the garden and to care for the garden. Right from the very beginning, God's plan has always been to be in partnership with his very special creation. And so God wants to send harvesters out, workers out into the field. We call them evangelists. God wants evangelists to go out. Maybe that's something that we've forgotten in the life of our churches. That we need evangelists to go out. Not everyone is an evangelist. We all have different roles to play. We all fulfill different parts within the life of the church. And each part is equally important in bringing people into the kingdom. I played football for, from the age of seven. The last full football match I played was at the age of 30, the week before we left South Africa to move here to Ireland. And I always played up front. Uh, particularly when I was older, I had a knack for being able to put the ball in the back of the net. I remember the two worst games I ever played. I remember them well because uh, one was against uh, Rhodes University. The other was against a team from Cape Town called Hellenic. And uh, in both of those games, uh, in the one game against Rhodes, uh, I was played at right back. Uh, and, and against Hellenic, I was played as a left back, completely out of position. Expected to use skills that were not my strengths at all. I was an absolute disaster. The lesson is that we all have different gifts and we need to use them to our strength to be effective for God's kingdom. It's nothing new that God partners with people. He partnered with people back in the Old Testament through leaders like Moses and David, through prophets. Uh, God has always partnered with people, but he wants us to be fruitful. And so it's important that we use our strengths and not struggle in our weaknesses to do the work that God has called us to do. So God wants us to be partners with him, but he wants us to be partners in a way that uses the strengths that we have. And something that we have lost somewhere along the way is the act of sending out evangelists. And so that is something that we need to be reminded of. If we are going to go and make disciples, some will go as evangelists. What we see in the New Testament is some play their role by being the prayer warriors. Some play their role by being those who care for the flock. Some play their role by being hospitable, opening up their homes so people can come and learn about the kingdom. But some need to go and tell. And it's important that we understand that. And that we pray to the Lord of the harvest. We pray to God that he will raise up evangelists amongst us and that we will send them to go and do their work. So that's the second thing. The third point I said was that it is hard to be a follower of Jesus. And we do discover that. One of the things that Jesus says to them is that um, I'm sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves. It's not a very inviting image that, God, that Jesus creates there. Sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves. And, and he paints a picture of some of the things that are going to happen to them. And he's quite specific in what he says. He says things like this. Um, well, he says that you're not going to be welcomed by some people. Um, that you're going to be insulted by some people. Uh, that people are going to ignore you. And they're not going to want to hear what you have to say. But, but there's other things that he says as well. He says this. He says, you will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. Brother will betray brother to death. And a father, his child, children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me. 
This is not the kind of thing that goes up in a job advertisement. Evangelists want to be prepared to be beaten and flogged in synagogues. Be prepared to be hated by your family. But time and again, Jesus paints a realistic picture that to be a follower of Jesus is not something easy to do. So don't expect it to be easy. Expect people to speak out against you. Expect people to try to silence you. Expect people to try to chase you away, to turn others against you. But there's a promise that comes with this. Because afterwards Jesus says, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. You see, as we go about doing the work of God, what we recognize is that the things of this world are the things that will pass away, like this world will pass away. And so all these struggles and hardships will not last for eternity. Because we keep our eyes focused on eternity. And those who are faithful to the end will be saved. And so we endure hardships. But Jesus also gives them some advice of how they can protect themselves, how they can look out for themselves during this time. And that's the fourth thing that I wanted to mention. Because after Jesus says to them that I'm sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves, he also says this. He says, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. When I grew up in South Africa, or where I grew up in South Africa, in the suburb of Port Elizabeth, where I grew up down the road from us, a few, a few roads down, was the valley. Um, we weren't allowed to play in the valley. That's what we were told. Don't go in there. It's dangerous. And, and to be honest, uh, telling a child not to do something uh, is, is, for me, it's challenging them to do it without getting caught. So even though my mom and dad uh, would have told us not to go and play in the valley, uh, during the holidays with our friends, you could be guaranteed that's where we were. But one thing that we did know was this. When you went down into the valley, watch out for snakes, particularly in the long grass. Because snakes are far more aware of their environment than we were. So you watch out for snakes. And this is what Jesus is saying here. Be wise as serpents. He's not saying be sneaky. He's not saying be cunning like um, the snake that we encounter, the serpent we encounter in Genesis. But what he is saying is this, be aware of your environment. Know what your opportunities are, know what your dangers are. So that you can be fruitful in the work that you've been called to do. Maybe the opposite of being as wise as serpents has been like a bull in a china shop. Completely oblivious to the environment and being destructive in what you do rather than being fruitful in what you do. Bringing out negative consequences rather than positive consequences. Be wise as serpents. Be aware of your environment. Know what your opportunities are so that you can be fruitful in what you do. Also know what your dangers are and what the risks are so that you can protect yourself and look out for yourself. And then he says, be as innocent as doves. And what he means by that is make sure that people don't have fuel to discredit you. Because the reality is that when people don't like the message, sometimes they will shoot the messenger. So make sure that you don't have anything that they can use against you to discredit the message. Because that's what they will try to do. Be as wise as serpents. Be as innocent as doves. You know, lockdown is now starting to ease. Even now as I look out here outside of my office window onto the main street running through Cookstown, the cars are backed up. They've been like this for the last couple of days now. The cars are backed up. People are up and down into town uh, as if lockdown had never happened. As if the last two months had never happened. Have we not learned anything? Is life just going to go on the way it has been in the past? The truth is, particularly with regards to the work that the followers of Jesus are called to do, nothing has changed. There are still people who are lost like sheep. Still people who are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. The passage that, Jesus, that, that we read ends with these words from Jesus. It says, Truly I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. You see, there is always work for us to do. Nothing has changed just because so much has changed. 
we are still called to go and make disciples. The harvest is still plentiful and the laborers are still few. Let's not forget that. As we start to think about reopening our church buildings, as we start to think about what church life looks like, as you start to think about what is going to be different when things go back to normal in your life, Perhaps it is how you think about the role that you have to play and the role that we as a church have to play in our communities to go and make disciples, to show God's love in some way to those who have not experienced God's love. Think about that. Think on that. Because God wants us to work with him. God wants us to be his partners. God wants to be in a relationship with each one of us, with me and with you. A relationship of love, a relationship of compassion, a relationship that brings about salvation to our souls. God is calling us. He's calling you to him. Let's not be afraid to respond in a faithful way. Let us not be afraid to pray to God to raise up evangelists amongst us and maybe even to be the evangelists amongst us so that God can use the gifts that he has given each one of us for the good of others, for his purposes and for his glory. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for this message that you have given us that reminds us that we have a calling to fulfill. But that calling, as we fulfill it, is not an easy calling. It will be hard. People will speak out against us. People will try to stop us or distract us from what we're doing. They will even try to discredit us. They will hate us and try to shut us up. And do whatever it takes to keep us silent. God, help us to remember that. But help us also to be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves so that we can be fruitful in what we do. Let us not confuse fruitfulness with busyness. Let us recognize the gifts within each other so that we can encourage one another and build one another up. But ultimately that we can work together as one body to fulfill your purpose. Loving God is locked down eases. We remember that there are still people who are unwell. There are still people who are struggling through all of this. That even during these last few months where all the conversation has been around coronavirus, there have been other illnesses and diseases that people have been struggling with. And so God, we lift the sick up to you and we pray for healing in their lives. Loving God, there are people who are anxious about what might happen once lockdown eases. May they know your peace. It is not only illness and disease that people have been living with. There has been fear in the everyday lives of people as they stay locked down in their homes. We have seen a terrible increase, Lord, in, in violence and abuse within the home. Loving God, we know that this period of easing of lockdown is a light that shines into the lives of these people. We pray, God, that you will give them courage in this time to find another path in their lives, to get out of these situations, Lord, that they feel trapped in. You are the God that brings freedom. And so, God, may they find opportunity to pursue that freedom. Protect them, Lord, and change the hearts of those who abuse. We pray, God, for comfort for those who have lost loved ones through these last two months. It is never an easy time to lose somebody that we love dearly. But God, in these few months, we have not been able to reach out to each other and embrace each other with love and compassion, just to feel a physical presence holding us and saying it's going to be okay. In their time of grief, Lord, may they feel your arms wrapped around them and know your compassion. And your peace. 
We thank you, God, that in all of these restrictions, the one thing that we have not been kept apart from has been your love. We thank you, God, that you are always with us, even when we are kept apart from others. We thank you that your love knows no bounds. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing once again or just listen to words on a screen, but may there be words that speak to you, words that remind us that when we come into a relationship with God, it is a relationship that is lived out every day. It is a relationship where we do work in partnership with God. Words that say, I will offer up my life in spirit and truth.